Well, the class members are back and you have been so faithful in attending class and so attentive as we've been learning about spiritual gifts. And we're so grateful that those of you who are in your home countries are studying about spiritual gifts along with us and we welcome everyone. Well, this is session 43 and we will be talking about just three verses, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And you can open up your Bibles there while I introduce this session. In the last session, we talk about the calling and the gifts. Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, an overview of the whole passage that is in Ephesians that deals with spiritual gifts. And there were three main points. Live a life worthy of the calling. Christ gave us gifts so that we might serve one another. And the third one was using our gifts to benefit the body. Well, there are five gifts that we call the equipping gifts. And as I begin to talk about this passage, it'll be clear, I think, why it's, these gifts have been given this name. I like football. Now, I don't mean American football. I like that too. I like what we call soccer. I have joined the rest of the world who loves soccer because as you know in America soccer is not a popular game. But when my son was five years old we took him to a soccer team and he played soccer from the time he was five until he graduated at age 18 from high school. And so going to his games, watching the team play, I began to understand how beautiful this game is, how simple it is, and yet how difficult it is. And in soccer, to show you that I do know something about the game, there are 11 players on the field. Interestingly enough, in American football, there are also 11 players on the field, but 11 players, and each player has a different position. And I understand that there's different combinations of positions in football, but that in general, you have several who in some combination are the forwards, the center and some wings, and you have some midfielders, center midfield, left and right wing. You have some defensemen who are center, left and right. There are special positions like stopper and striker, and then, of course, the most important position of all, goalie, which is the position I would never want to play. <laughs> I would never want all that pressure on me, and it's a good thing I'm not tall enough to play the goalie position. But there is one person on that field every game who has a special position. It is the player on each team who wears the armband, who says, I am the captain of this team. And the captain of the team has very important responsibilities with his teammates. And we will talk about some of those in relation to the body of Christ in an instant. So that's an introduction, but the analogy of a soccer team applies to the body of Christ. You see, in Ephesians 4, 11 through through 13, God has appointed not one captain, but five co-captains of the team. If everybody who goes to a local church is viewed as the football team, everybody's got their positions. Some are forwards, some are midfielders, some are defense, some are goalies, and there are five co-captains. And let's take a look at Ephesians 4, 11, and we will learn who those co-captains of the team are. It was he, God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Five gifts. Those gifts, they are all captains of the team. So let's see how these play out. First of all, he doesn't lift, list gifts, he lists offices. So he says some have been uh, uh, apostles, some have been prophets, some have been evangelists, again, an office. 
evangelist, pastor, which in the Greek means shepherd, and the final one is teaching. Now, as we know from our earlier studies, teacher, these gifts are linked together and many people think that it's just one gift. I believe that while that's true, there's pastor shepherd, pastor teacher, there's also the gift of shepherding and the gift of teaching. So now let's translate these captains into what their uh, roles are, okay? This person, the apostles, has the gift of apostleship. It's not listed there, but is definitely one of the spiritual gifts, prophecy. Then we go on to evangelism. And some of you have some of these gifts. Others of you do not have a co-captain gift. And that's okay. I'm going to say shepherding here, and then finally teaching there. Now, if these people play on the field, and they are co-captains, what positions would they play? in a football game. Well, apostles go out from the church, sent forth to take on a special responsibility. I would say they're like the forwards. They're out there in the lead. They're trying to score the goals. All right? And I would say prophets are probably the defense. They're in the back, making sure that nothing gets passed that's going to harm the church. Evangelists, along with apostles, they are, go out from the church and they spread the good news. I would say they play forward. And then we look at the shepherds. Well, I think they play midfield. They're not defending. They're not trying to score the goal. They're just trying to care for the people in the middle. So let's say they're mid, midfield. And then finally, teachers. I think they are also trying to support the people in the midfield, so we'll make them midfielders. Gee, have you noticed that there's a position missing? A very important position, the goalkeeper. And as I thought about this, I was trying very hard to make one of these positions the keeper so that we would cover that all, and I thought, no, none of them really is the keeper. There's a gift that's not a co-captain gift that I think also gets to play. Kind of a reserve who gets to play. I would say the gift of discernment is the person who defends and makes sure that nobody scores a goal. That they can sense who's telling the truth, who's uh, saying what's right, who's saying what's wrong. So in my analogy, I'm trying to show that God has given five gifts, the captain's role, and that they have certain gifts that they use, and they have specific positions that they play on the field. Now, I've run out of space, but I will tell you that I think among the reasons God chose these gifts is because they represent a cross category of all the roles. Remember they said we, there are those who expand the church, there are those who instruct, those who care for the church, uh, those who manage the church, and those who have a special message to give for the church. As we look at these roles, let's take them one at a time. Apostles extend the church. Prophets instruct the church. Evangelists extend the church. Pastor, in this role, the pastor is managing the church. In the shepherd role, he's caring for the church. In the teaching role, he is instructing the church. There's no doubt that the pastor is probably the chief captain among the captains. And then finally, the teacher who is instructing the church. The only category of roles that's missing are tongues and interpretation, which would be the gifts that give a special message to the congregation under special circumstances. So I don't know, maybe they play during a shootout. 
In any case, you can see where God has given these captains, assigned them roles, made sure that all the different areas of the church are represented. And then he goes on to say they have a special responsibility. Now, why did God choose these five? I mean, despite the fact that they all cover the categories of roles, are there other reasons they might have been chosen? I think, first of all, they're all upfront gifts. They're not behind the scenes gifts. They're people who are strategic to the church because everybody sees them exercising their gift. And it would be very important that they are accountable to the whole church for the exercise of their gift. It would be very important that the people had confidence in the captains so that they could actually see the work that was being done. But I think that there's a third and final reason. God said, let me give these co-captain roles to these five uh, spiritual gifts. And that is, every one of those gifts is essential to the smooth functioning of the body of Christ. So let's go back and say, not everybody has these five roles. Does this mean somehow you're less important? Like these are the first class Christians, you're Christian second class? Not a bit. We've learned time and again that all roles are equal, but all gifts are different. It says each has a different gift, each has a different role, and each has a different position to play in the body of Christ. We know that you play the game as much as these co-captains play the game. So you're on the field with them. There are six other positions. And so you're on the field as well, but more behind the scenes and not having a leadership role. And remember, the captain is responsible to the coach of the team. And in this analogy, the coach is Jesus Christ. So this is not a position to take lightly. They are captains of the local congregation and they have a special role that's assigned to them by God that appears in verse 12. These five are to prepare God's people for works of service. See, it works like this. The captain has a special responsibility to his team. He has to make sure that they're all trained, that they know their positions, that they're ready to play, and that they do their job on the field. That's the captain's role. So transferring this to the church analogy, these five have to make sure that everybody else with any of the other gifts are trained to do their job. They're to make sure that they're in the right position according to their spiritual gift. They have to make sure they're ready to play, that spiritually they're strong and not wandering from the faith. And then they have to encourage them to help the team win. So the analogy, I think, of a football team really does help us get this sense of what is the body of Christ and how does it operate. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. What does it mean to prepare God's people for works of service? Well, one last time here, I went back to look at the Greek to say, what does that term prepare mean? And in the Greek, it means katarthesmas, katarthesmas. It is G2675 in Strong's, and it literally means equipping. It doesn't mean preparing. It means equipping. It means making sure that the team has all the equipment that they need. Do you have football shoes? Do you have the socks? Do you have the uniform? You know, do you have the attitude? Are you ready to play? That's the idea. There's 
a component of this that's training. There's a component of this of positioning, making sure they're in the right position on the field. And then there's the component of oversight, making sure that they actually are doing the jobs. And then there's the role of encouraging the whole team and serving as an example to the whole team of what the team should be. So as we've said before, this isn't preparing, it's equipping. It means to make one what he ought to be. You have a spiritual gift. This is to make you what you ought to be with that spiritual gift. It's to make one fit and ready for duty. So we get the idea that their job is to prepare everybody else to actually go out and serve people. These five co-captains serve you who don't have these gifts by training you, by positioning you, by supervising you, and by encouraging you to be part of the team and to help the team win the game. It means that every believer at church must know their spiritual gift, find the right place to serve in the church that is the best fit for them, and to make sure that 100% of the church congregation is serving. Now, I don't know how your church operates, but every church that I've been in, I can tell you, far from 100% of the congregation serves. There is something called Pareto's Law. It's called the 80-20 rule. For example, in, this applies in many situations, but you will never fill up the church more than 80%. You might hit 100%, but people are uncomfortable where there's no seats. And so 80% is about the max when they plan for a new church building, and whether it's a, a sanctuary or an auditorium, they plan for 80 per, for 100%, but they know that only 80 is going to come. So in the churches I've been in, 20% of the people do 100% of the work. And 80% of the people are glad they're doing the work because they're sitting and watching them work. This is not the way the church is supposed to operate. The five co-captains are to equip everyone else in the church to be serving in the church in some ministry, exercising their spiritual gift for the benefit of the entire church. Hear me clearly. Serving is not an option. It's not a choice. It is a command of Jesus that you serve one another. And you have to take that command seriously. There are too many people in the church who are glad to come to church, listen to the teaching, enjoy the music, eat the food in the fellowship time afterwards, and then see ya, be back next week. But they do nothing to help the church grow strong. They do nothing to support the ministry of the church. They are takers, not givers. There is a reason why there is a Dead Sea in the Galilee area in Israel. The Dead Sea means water flows in, but it never flows out. It's dead. In every lake, you must have water flowing in, and then you must have water flowing out. There needs to be input, there needs to be output. And what these people do is they go and they are there, they're in the church, but they never give anything back to the church. This is a very serious problem. So I would like you to think of it in terms of your own contribution to your church. Are you, in fact, playing the game? If everyone serves, we win. 
the local church grows in numbers, we grow in spiritual strength, the local church stays united, the local church becomes more mature. That is, we become like Jesus Christ. So I have a challenge to all of you watching by DVD and all of you in the classroom. Are you playing the game on the field? Or are you up in the stands as part of the spectators watching other people play? If you're a spectator, my challenge to you is get in the game. You were designed to serve. You were equipped to serve and you are expected to serve. So, serve. Know your spiritual gift. You do that by serving. Know where your position is in the body of Christ. The ministry that you could best make a difference. Regularly use your spiritual gift and be an active participant in your local congregation. The Church of Christ needs you. If you're not playing the game, the Church of Christ cannot be all that it might be. Instead, we are ineffective, we are less beneficial to one another, and we're certainly not presenting a good witness to the entire world who is wondering, is there anything real about this Christianity? I mean, is it really true? When they see everybody serving, everybody united, they see the sense of love in the congregation, and they see Jesus in the faces of the people serving, they will come to Christ. So please, for the sake of the church, and because you are commanded to by Jesus Christ, get in the game. In our next session, We'll continue on to Ephesians 4, but we'll look at verses 14 to 16, which is about the body of Christ in action. Thank you for joining us.